in 1968, Apollo 8 went to the moon. circle the moon and I was watching it on television and at a certain point one of the astronauts casually said we're going to turn the camera around and show you the earth and he did and that was the first time I had ever seen the planet hanging in space like that and it was profound. I think that for me like for many other people it was quite a shock. I don't think any of us had any expectations about how it would give us such a different perspective. I think the focus had been, we're going to the stars, we're going to the planets, and suddenly we look back at ourselves and it seems to imply um, a new kind of self-awareness. One of the astronauts said, when we originally went to the moon, our total focus was on the moon. We weren't thinking about looking back at the Earth. But now that we've done it, that may well have been the most important reason we went. Looking back on Earth was titled or called The Overview Effect by Frank White. There have been approximately 540 now, 540 some odd individuals who've been out into space. 24 have seen the Earth from afar, the full Earth, and the rest of them travel around in, for example, the International Space Station, and they see approximately 1 11th of the planet at a time when they're looking. I've spoken to a few of these astronauts, and I've asked them what have they thought, and you can look and hear their perspectives and they're profoundly changed. To look down on Earth and see that thin veil covering it. If they look down and they say, look for Italy, they can't find it. They actually can't find Germany or Brazil. They can't find China. All they see is land. And if they look down and they look, for example, the Pacific Ocean, or they look for the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, they can't find those either. Because there's just one ocean. And that's the planet in which we live in, live on. And I think I went the wrong way. We talked this morning and used the term the age of infinite. We're not in the fourth industrial revolution. If we are going to go into the real true fourth industrial revolution, which includes Internet of Things, which includes connective devices, includes technology that drives and connects us together, that doesn't to me seem like the next paradigm shift that we need, nor the one that we want. We're looking at the age of infinite, infinite possibilities, infinite resources. And Bruce had brought up earlier this morning, there's a book, Abundance. And I think if we continue to look at the world as scarcity and abundance, we're going to live in a world in which we have the haves and have nots. And since the gilded age of time, Right now on Earth, we have the biggest disparity of wealth in history between different groups. I live primarily in Hong Kong, New York and Hong Kong, spent a tremendous amount of time in San Francisco, and I can tell you, I can see the disparity of wealth sitting on the streets of Hong Kong every day, even with the protests going on, I see everything that's happening there. Today what I'd like to share with you is how we might be able to change the future of the space industry and how I believe there's an optimistic approach to getting there if we made some simple changes, which will require some work, but not as much of it was a cost as a single Maersk engine that's put into a Maersk shipping vessel. We could change the future of all species on Earth by making just a few simple modifications. <coughs> This morning, we add, the question was asked of me or the group, the panel, what are some of the things or ideas that we have found to be true in the industry that have altered the way in which we live? And you can see these online. Many of them are very, very prevalent. Uh, we've seen the air filtration systems, water filtration systems, even as I spoke about the firemen running around with a pack on their back. Well, that same canister is being used in uh, hydrogen buses today. 
All of these technologies have altered how we live, but what we don't see up there are the individuals who work for these companies who then left that company because of what they learned, how they saw it, the fact that they learned about space, and then went into another industry and created something that we might not have thought of as to be space related, but humans build upon the lessons that they've developed over years and learned from other people, whether they've read it, they've seen it, they've heard about it. Well, in this case, what happens if a lot more of the ideas that we even realize have been created by individuals somehow tied to space? And the reason that I, I bulk all of these together and I look at the overview effect and the, the, the two images are up here is one that we have to start looking at all of the countries as separate and distinct. Even though we have moved into an age of popularism and, and protectionism, I, I think that the future, if we we're to have one that we would like to, not we, I want to say I would like to see, and I'm saying I because I can't speak for you, I believe that we could have a much brighter future for ourselves and our children if we had a different mindset. And that in order for that to happen, we have to change policy. We have to change the rules in which we govern, the rules in which we work, including in the space industry. One way to do that is something called a paradigm shift. And you probably all heard of paradigm shifts. I brought it up earlier this morning, too. Is if you were going to move from Macedonia, or if you were going to move from France, or you were going to move to any other country, especially where the language is very different and the eating and cultural foods are different, that's a paradigm shift. You have to kind of readjust, reassess, figure out what to do. And it's challenging, but when you do that, they have found and discovered that individuals who move from one country to another tend to find more opportunities in that culture than the people living in that culture because they've become accustomed to it. This is how we live, this is how we do things. And someone walks in from another culture and says, wait, 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 wait. There's a whole different way to do that. And one statistic I once uh, I have used before is 56% of the startups in Silicon Valley, it's not the only place in the world, but Silicon Valley, came from people who were immigrants, who looked at the world in a different way and saw a paradigm shift. So what if we could change the entire world to paradigm shift? And it's not, it wouldn't be as hard as one might think. But let me give you an example of how we do it improperly. Let's imagine here that we're going to generate a solution. So we're right now at this hotel, and we want to get to the airport, which is about 24 minutes away. Now, if you had to be at the airport in 12 minutes, how would you be there? Somebody. How would you be there in 12 minutes? Really fast. If you had to be there in nine minutes, Fly, helicopter. Six minutes. Teleportation, correct. You're right on target. The fact is that humans are what, are, what I have labeled, it's again, that's just something I have come up with, is we're additive thinkers. We solve challenges that we have by going faster and faster with the knowledge that we have. We want to solve the ocean, so we try to do it, the challenges in the ocean, we try to do it faster. We want to solve the challenges with a certain environment. We do that faster. The truth is you could have Skyped. I didn't say you physically had to be there. I said you had to be there. But our mind assumed, because I gave you time and distance, that you had to do that. And that's how humans address many, many challenges. I've said in many boardrooms and with many executives around the world. And there's this additive type thinking, even in the space industry using the lessons that have come before. But how do you get someone to do that paradigm shift? Well, space people already have to do this. In order to be in the space industry, you have to be thinking of a different set of parameters. But the rest of the world is still solving the challenges it has using old thinking or non-paradigm shifting thinking. Let's travel back in time about six years ago. I'm at a conference. I'm standing next to, I just spoke and there's a guy next to me and he looks at me and he says, if you ever want a tour of NASA, give me a call. I said, okay, I'm here every month, I'll give you a call. The next month I fly into to Silicon Valley, because I'm there every month. I go to their offices in the portal and there is a woman who sits next to me, uh, we, um, Lynn Harper. She is one of the, considered the founders of astrobiology. We have this unbelievable conversation about biology. 
and Dan Rasky sits across, he's worked on, he runs the portal, and Bruce was on the phone, and he had made me sit down in the table, and I see, he comes and sits down, and we start talking. I went for three hours, I did not get that tour. So he says, come back next time and you'll get a tour. Next time I go back, I sit down again, big mistake, three more hours, didn't get the tour. The third time I did. But I remember the first question that Bruce had asked me. He paradigm shifted me without him thinking in that way. He was getting me to learn a lesson and he said, where does platinum come from? I didn't know. I think I said the ground or mining. And his reaction surprised me. He said, oh, platinum's not indigenous to Earth. It comes from asteroids. And his next question was, and when you look up at the moon, what do you see? And I'm thinking, moon, cheese. It's got to be cheese, right? And he says, no, the, uh, you see the craters from asteroids. Well, he went then on to talk about some of these elements that are uh, uh, available up there that I had never heard about. So this was really changing my thinking, even though my background was sciences. And then he proceeded to tell me a short little narrative that I've gone into more detail here, is that uh, a Danish chemist had discovered the uh, aluminum. He said, do you know where aluminum comes from, or the story of aluminum? I didn't know that either. So he said, do you know where aluminum comes from? And then it started off with this chemist, and then what happened was, in the early years of, plat uh, of aluminum, kings and queens used to serve the most precious and famous people with their aluminum, not their gold and their silver, but aluminum was so precious that in the United States, the top of the uh, Washington Monument has a six pound cap of aluminum. And over time, that process was improved, getting it down to a point where today, aluminum is really cheap. We use it for aluminum foil and for our mobile phones and everything else. But what if we had, it wasn't an abundance, but an infinite amount of these supplies? Come to find out that the moon gets hit or we found on just one asteroid that is hit, we have found that there is more platinum in that one asteroid than we have used in the history of mankind. The history of mankind in just one asteroid. And for every 100, there are three that have that much platinum. And we mine approximately uh, 192 tons of platinum per year, but it takes us 64 million million tons of soil to get that small amount. So to give you a relationship, a tractor trailer comes in, American sized tractor trailer, you need four of them to do all the platinum on Earth. That's it. But you need 60 million Toyota Corollas just to mine that small amount. He talked about the need or the fact that we would be thinking differently, we'd have an abundance. We also talked about the fact that there's water on the moon, which I did not know about, and I can even tell you that a person who was funding Space IL did not know that there was water on the moon, and they were funding it. On my third visit there, which finally, on the last time, I did not go into NASA, and I got to the gate, and Bruce came out to me. Luckily, I carry my passport, because I found out my driver's license doesn't work at NASA. And we went around, and I would be honest with you, I was not very impressed with NASA. You might have been, because you love space, but for me, it was okay. Except for one time, we were sitting in the flight simulator, and a guy sticks his head and he says, you want me to turn on for you? And I said, yeah. And I looked at Bruce, I said, do they turn this on for everybody? And he said, no. They didn't know me, they just turned it on for me. And I was able to play a little bit with the flight simulator. And afterwards, we went for, uh, oh, oh, by the way, I'm not a space guy. So everything I'm telling you that I'm not a space person, this is just me enjoying an experience. Afterwards, we went to a restaurant called Scratch, and we started talking about space, and I heard a lot from Bruce of the challenges that were going on. And at one point, I don't know if I was frustrated or he said something in a way, and I said, Bruce, you're trying to solve a 1,000 Rubik's Cubes at once with NASA and space. I said, if you, would you like to hear how I would get us to the moon? And he said, sure. And I started to add a lot of my own experiences into the equation. I said, first of all, there are a lot of competing challenges to getting to space, that the assumption that people love space, that, there's, uh, that the industry is very complicated and in getting inclusive of it. There are a series of things that stop me from loving space but just being engaged. 
And I also then took a few concepts out of my own head and I said, okay, first of all, there's 7.5 billion people on this planet. Let's use that as a number. Seven, uh, second is that I, I saw disconnects in the industry. And one of the things I do is I solve big challenges for major companies all over the world. And I look for disconnects, things that don't tend to be connected. And I felt that the space industry seemed a little bit off. And the third thing I did when I was going to answer this question, I'll give you the answer that I gave him, is there's an expression, think outside the box. And I don't believe we think outside the box. I believe we think complete, great innovators actually think inside the box. And what do I mean by that? One day I was sitting down and I said to myself, you're an innovator. You've written a book. You've got patents and cell phone technology, battery technology, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, okay, I'm an innovator. Why don't I ever use the word think outside the box? And I said, because I never think outside the box. I always think inside. That was my gut reaction. So what I'd like you to think about for just a moment is when you have a challenge put in front of you, what you do is you take that challenge and you look inside your head and you say, ah, oh, let me make a rectangle. And you put everything in it and you try to figure out how that doesn't work and you move it to the side. Then you take the next one and you say, I'll make a triangle. Ah, oh, that's a lot better. And the next one you say, ah, I'll call a friend or I'll look something up or I'll, 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 my history, I know something. And you put them together and say, what if I put these two together and you create solutions? Great innovators are not looking for answers. They tend to be people who are constantly filling their head with ideas. So when something comes up, they say, ah, I got it. Great innovators don't think outside the box. They think inside it, but they make it a huge box. They travel and they learn and they experience. They don't just stay focused on one industry. Many competing industries happen because somebody learns something here and shifts it over to another industry. Well, I've worked in nanotechnology, aerospace, water and sewage, construction. I had a company in artificial intelligence. I was pulling on my ideas to, in order to make this work for Bruce. And I pulled on some of these things. I know that people like phases and stories, so I created four phases for Bruce. And the second thing that I did is I created a storyline. And it took about an hour, and I'm not going to go into it. There's a paper that you could read on that if you'd like. It's not long. And I created a narrative for Bruce. I realized that one of the things we had to do in the space industry is stop trying to sh have a shotgun go at the whole industry and solve everything at once. What I said is Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, and within months of him breaking it, other people did. So once proof of concept happens, others can do it. No different than landing or reusable rocket. Once it was done once, someone says, I could do it again. And then someone else says, I could do that again. It becomes faster and faster. I also knew that we're in an age of platforms. Platforms giving us capability and visibility into markets. We had ways of things and things we've never seen before. So what if we could tie those together? What I said to Bruce was the first thing we need is a box with a roof on the moon. Proof of concept. Not 500 different things happening at once, not terraforming the moon, not terraforming Mars, Get proof of concept, everybody working on one thing, get a box with a roof on the moon. And we talked about where that comes from, and I'm not, again, won't go into all the historical parts of what I shared with him. I said, because then once we've done it, other people could see it's possible. The second thing we need to do is we need to create an industrial park, a building, like a submarine size. Major companies can get 40 square meter and they can pay $10 million for the first wine and the first perfume and the first space mining or first rocks, or what, but not government funded. Bruce asked several times about government funding and I said, no, this is, human, this is not government funding. We get a box with a roof and then we get this industrial park and it's going to be tough living. It's not going to be fun and Bruce even used the term which I love, hot bunks. In submarines, you get into a bunk, and when you leave, someone else gets in, and when that person leaves, someone else gets in, so it's a hot bed, and you live that way. So this is gonna be tough like explorers. But once we include the, now we've got these two buildings, that's it, and we sell something from the Earth, from space to the Earth, and the Earth to space. And we create our first real sale, and then people know commerce is possible. Then what we do is create an extended stay hotel. Little did I know that Bigelow made his money in what was called extended stay hotels. 
It's a place where you'd have a, a meter and a half by two and a half meter. You could put up pictures of your family, put your suit on, you share the environment with people, and that would be the place that you'd live, a little bit nicer. Just no different than the people landing on a certain place and building a fort and then having a nicer fort to live in the next time they come through. And the last one would be community. And that community would not be the way we see it in all these pictures and all these diagrams of terraforming. It's going to be a place probably where major corporations are going to put eight or 10 or 12 people to live and work so that they can continue the space exploration. This by itself, this by itself is a huge, 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 huge challenge. This could take years to build. We're not terraforming yet. We don't have millions of people living on the moon. Just this is huge. But I learned in martial arts, in the black belt in Taekwondo, that if you go to punch a board and you hit it, you'll break your hand. A martial artist knows that you go all the way through. Here's the board, all the way, and that's how you smash it. If you go partially, you break your hand. You have to go all the way. Well, this is what we'd have to do to get all the way through. One plan, one objective, nobody winning. It's humankind making changes. And then I learned this. When we show models or pictures of the planets, we usually show all of the planets at the same time. But with the real planets, it's very hard to do because the real planets have a lot of space between them. No, I'm not kidding. I mean, a lot of space. A, a lot of space. Okay, let's say that this balloon is the sun. It's a little over a meter across. And the planet Mercury would be here, 39 meters away, and it would be just about this big. That's all there would be to the planet Mercury. Here, at 72 meters, that would be Venus. Now, the sun's still behind us. And look, up here at 100 meters, our own Earth. Hi, everybody. Hi, Bill. Now we got to get serious. Uh oh. Huh. Ah. There's Mars. And the distances start to get very large. Those planets, those models, are the actual size. Now the sun's still back there. And here's Jupiter. 520 meters from the sun. That's over half a kilometer. And Jupiter would be about this big. Isn't that wild? Here's Saturn, the one with the big rings, 953 meters from the sun, almost a kilometer out, way out here. And this would be Uranus, almost two kilometers from the sun. It's way out here. Are you beginning to get the picture? Everything is really far apart. There's a lot of space in space. Things are really far apart on this model. That's because everything's to scale. That's why we don't always make models like this to scale, because they're huge! <laughs> Are we there yet? Here's Neptune, an icy blue planet, three kilometers from our weather balloon sun. Go 
gotta be around here someplace. Down here, Bill. Huh. Bill, oh. down here. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Piece of cake. Here's Pluto, four kilometers from our sun. Pluto is 40 times farther away from the sun than our Earth. It's over six billion kilometers from the sun. Do you get it now? The distances between the real planets in real outer space are huge. 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 I remember that day when my friend Dave Sinken had said, have you seen the Bill Nye bike thing? And I said, no. I've been working with NASA now for two years, or a year, a year and a half. And I said, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? This is just the spec. You've got to realize it's a three-dimensional space. And everybody's talking about Mars. And I don't think we should be going to Mars now. We have this little thing that's not far away from us. We should focus on that first for proof of concept. And it was not long after that then I was at NASA, and someone walked into the office, and that was right after Elon Musk in 2 minutes and 19 seconds when the rocket blew up in space, it blew up on takeoff uh, as it went up 2 minutes and 19 seconds in. And I remember the guy walking in and saying, say, say, David, David, space is hard. Space is really hard. And I looked at him and I said, no, space is not hard. Earth is hard. We have politics, which we talked about at lunch. We have gra a deep gravity well. We have uh, technology issues. We've got capital issues. Earth is really hard. Space, when we're up there, we have our challenges. But we're fairly good when we get up there. The challenge is that we're solving the idea of going into space in a way where we're not really taking a look at the solutions that we need that pair with Earth. At least that's my interpretation. So for example, right now, last time I looked, there were over 124 space launch industries. So there's a dark side. 124 space launch companies plus with not enough backlog to fill maybe five of them with full-time business. What happens if an industry collapses because there's not enough capital? I spoke in Luxembourg at the Space Forum. Two years ago, there were 500 people in the audience. This year, there was no more than about 70 because they lost $15 million to Planet Resources, space mining company way ahead of its time. And uh, the other company, Deep Space Industries, also fell at the same time. And those were big news. I was just speaking with someone from Space IL. They were the, the rocket from Israel that was able to put and they smashed onto the moon. And they were going to do Space IL too. The government said they weren't going to fund it. The major investor tried to get people involved. And everybody said they're out. So there's no Space IL too. It stopped. And I had said at, in Luxembourg, I said, 1969, looking at those people at that time, would they have ever, ever, ever in a million years thought that 50 years from then, this year, that we would have not gotten further than we are today? We've had some great things happen. We have $350 million industry, uh, billion dollar industry. We've got satellites. We've got technology. We were able to uh, send con um, uh, rovers out uh, to different planets. But they wouldn't have never thought that 50 years later. If we don't do things right this time, you will be sitting in a room 50 years from now, believing that then it was going to happen, that it won't happen, and it will be the same scenario happen. Not because you're not interested. It's because we're making mistakes, and we don't have a purpose in how we build it. My belief is that we have to, if we can get more companies involved in the space industry in a different light, we could change the entire paradigm of how we grow businesses. And those industries, most of them won't go into space, will start solving challenges because they're thinking about space differently, of challenges we have on Earth. We need a larger purpose. I think we need a larger purpose as a species, not just as a larger purpose for space. So I'm going to go over very quickly, like skipping over mountaintops or glaciers, a larger purpose, leveraging technology of global effort and innovating faster. Project Moonhot Foundation was established with a tool that I'll show you, and you'll, you can get the white paper. We'll send it to you if you'd like it. 
to change how we accelerate the space industry so that we can get there faster. And there are tools that we can do very inexpensively to do that. But there are six major things happening on this planet at the exact same time, and they're all converging. For example, we have climate change, mass extinction. I've been saying 12 to 24 species disappear every day. The United Nations came out with the number 200. The last black rhino was killed last year of a certain type. We'll never see them again. We have unintended consequences. We consume a, a lot of animals. I'll go over that in a minute. Social displacement from artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, 3D printing, sensor uh, tech, and synthetic engineering are decimating industries. Accountants are an industry. They now have surgical tools with artificial intelligence that can do surgery on pigs. They've done them on pigs, where it can artificially do the surgery. So we're getting rid of physicians and architects, as well as factories I've seen in China go from 2,000 employees to 200 in a matter of a few weeks. You cannot absorb that type of change. We have resource depletion, and we have political unrest, and that's actually in my town of Hong Kong. So let's quickly take water. It's expected that in the next 15, uh, 20, 30 years, we'll, sea levels will rise about 15 cm. Six inches, doesn't sound like a lot. But six inches, when if you, uh, I heard a weather reporter in Dallas, Texas, or talk about Houston and the big disaster that happened in Houston. And the guy said, well, if Houston was traveled back 100 years ago in position, it wouldn't have been damaged the same way. What do you mean it wouldn't have been damaged the same way? He said, well, the oceans were cooler, and the water was about 30 cm a foot lower. But he didn't also add that the precipitation in the atmosphere was a lot higher. Fast forward 100 years, well, I'm going to do only 100 years here, split it in half, 15 cm in 40 years. There's set, in Bangladesh, there's 156 million people. I've worked there. It floods every single year. People are displaced. You'll have 20, 30, 40, 50 million people displaced. Indonesia, 17,500 islands, 270 million people. We're going to lose islands. The Maldives will be gone. Florida, which has 21 million people, 8 million on the coastal lines, it's already rising up. You might have seen the pictures of Miami and Fort Lauderdale having water going up through the systems because it's a sand dune. And the Greater Bay in China, which is one of the fastest growing places, is at, was used to be called the Pearl River Delta. It's below seawater. That will be displaced because the hurricanes and typhoons will be so much stronger. Space might be able to address these challenges that are happening in our atmosphere. Just about two, three months ago, satellite imagery showed that in the rainforest, 740 square kilometers of forest in one month was plowed away. In one month. Because we're using this for resources, resource depletion, as well as oxygen and others. So here's a quick four questions to see how well you are thinking about tomorrow and the future. If you were to buy, uh, manufacture a pair of jeans, wear the jeans or throw them out, which one is more ecologically more challenging? What do you think? Washing them, wearing them. Because every time you wash them, you have microfibers that come off, you have to use water and chemicals. Second one is, uh, what is worse, a single-use plastic bag or a cloth bag? We're really concerned about our plastics, aren't we? Don't be. Because that, plastic, that cloth bag would have to be used 131 times to equal the economic damage of that plastic bag. And if you reuse the plastic bag for your garbage and tied it up, it's over 170 times. That's using the same thing for three and a half years nonstop. We don't do that as humans today. We can't even, I bet your closets are so full compared to 20 years ago. We're buying and consuming. What if we could solve this with space? What's destroying our oceans more? Solid waste, agricultural, uh, municipal waste, overfishing, or CO2 emissions and others into the atmosphere? Which is destroying our oceans the most? It's a tough one. It's a tough one. 
they're all destroying them simultaneously. Those are the three biggest challenges. Uh, solid waste runoff, the carbon dioxide is going into the oceans and changing the acidification, and the overfishing. All three of them are destroying our oceans very quickly. And the last one here is what is the impact of a selfie? We talk about plastic bags, we talked about watching what we eat, we talked about all sorts of things. One selfie, according to the guy who invented Siri, having to, that picture has to go through all the coding to go to Instagram or Facebook, is the equivalent of turning on a 20 watt light bulb, three of them, for one hour, each photo you post. So we worry about all the things that we paradigm the world is telling us, but the reality is we're living in a world and we're destroying it every day and we have to make some changes quickly. So here's paradigm shifting. Watch what happens really quickly if we start to think differently. You're in a spacecraft or on the moon and your shirt is worn out. What do you do with it? You, you throw it in the airlock and shoot it out? You keep on wearing it, but once it's done wearable, what do you do? You reuse it, you use it as a rag, you rip it up, maybe a headband, you look kind of cool, whatever the use may be. But what if? But what if we change that thinking? If you lived on, uh, if you were to think of all the homes that were around where you live, does everybody have a hammer? But if you're in a spacecraft and there are 10 people, do you need 10 hammers? Why? Shared economy. See, space is a lesson for humans in living differently. So what we are working and we need to complete is something called the zapper. Imagine this, you're in the spacecraft, you're done with your shirt, you take it, you put it in the zapper, it hits it with beams, breaks it down into molecular components, it goes into different filtration and it's used to 3D print new items. That every house on Earth, every apartment on Earth, every business on Earth has a zapper in their home. Do we have to worry about plastic bags anymore? Do we have to worry about reusing or buying clothing? Do we have to worry about a lot of the challenges that I just talked about because we have energy capabilities that come with it? If we're in, if in space already, we might have power, uh, power generation coming down to Earth. We can actually clean the carbon dioxide that we have on this planet today, but the big challenge we have is energy. If we're in space, we can solve the energy challenges of the atmosphere. Uh, the zapper doesn't exist yet. That's for you to figure out how to build. That's on one of your project lists. I talked about earlier about Get a Har Ready. I'm, at, I'm actually going there next, the Silicon Valley, uh, at a competition, the Global Technology Symposium, where Bruce and I met. And this guy is the Mars guy I talked about. He loves Mars, crazy about Mars. He decided to make the nanotube that was able to filter a, a molecule of water. And that water goes all the way through, comes out the other side clean and fresh, but we're not on Mars. That was the challenge to share. So what's amazing here is he's now using it to change the filtration on Earth. And he's in India and he's using it in India. And one of the things that I say about India is that India is not a developing nation. It's not a third world country. India is one of the oldest nations on this planet. They have policy and they have a structure and they have religion that causes it to be one of the least productive with over 600 million people being impacted just by agriculture. But I don't consider India a third world or an old. It's an old country. It's been around a long time. It's policy and the way we make decisions that have caused India to stay where it is. It hasn't figured out how to give fresh water to its people. So education is going to be much further down that pipeline. But here's one that's really interesting. This is a surprise. This guy is Yossi Amin out of Israel. He has a company called Space Pharma. Really cool. They have a CubeSat. For those of you who don't know CubeSat, it's about 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. Uh, cube and they put them together and the, his satellite's about this big. I won't go into the pricing, but it's very inexpensive. And he was able to uh, take an experiment, eight uh, in the bottom, he created a lab, and they sent it up into space and they injected, for pharma, they injected an organic into a chemical reaction and on Earth it would fall apart. The gravity would drop the molecule so that they couldn't bind. 
So imagine trying to make an, uh, a circle right now and you put the pieces, but every time you did, they fell. But in microgravity, the molecules have the time to be able to get in place and then they put the keystone in the pin and they lock it. And they were able to create molecules we've never seen on Earth. His first had eight experiments that they can monitor and they took photographs of. The next one, I think, has over 240 experiments because they could put in micro uh, injections. But on a podcast I did with him, he shared with me something that scared me. He said, we are being able to take a neuron and recreate the neuron grows in space. So you're probably thinking maybe back surgery or people with neurological problems. He said, but the challenge is the neuron grew 10 times longer than we expected it to grow. Well, what does that mean for babies being born if the neurons grow at a different rate than the mitochondrion react than the, than the other cells create? The two brother, the brother experiment in space, oh my God, we don't know if space, if we could even live on Mars or get to Mars. We have no clue the implications of microgravity and gravity and long-term exposure. We have no clue where we, why we're going all the way to Mars when we haven't even figured out how to stay in our own atmosphere and figure this out. And he scared me with that tech. According to the U.S., which is the only place in the world right now that keeps track of this, China's worse, India is worse also, the United States dumps 12 billion gallons, 12 billion gallons of solid waste runoff. That's not uh, agri uh, agricultural runoff, industrial runoff. That's just solid waste runoff into the oceans every single day. China and India are worse. And we're worried about plastic bags and straws. To give you a reference, if you have a bathtub, fill that up 320 million times and every single day that goes into the oceans. Again, plastic bags, our focus is off. Space can solve this because we'll think differently on how to solve these challenges. And just uh, 10,000 years ago, there were one million pigs, chickens, and um, pigs, chickens, and cows on Earth. There were one million. Today we consume 69 billion, with only 7.5 billion people, animals per year. It does not include a fish or water animals because they are weighed in tons. You've seen them on the deck, they just dump them. So maybe it's 100 billion. 170 billion animals, if you had three, six shrimp on your meal last night, that's six animals. We consume that every year on Earth. Now think. Star Trek Enterprise, did you ever see a cow? There were cows on Star Trek Enterprise? In, on the ship? Pigs? Chickens? Did they slaughter them, have a slaughterhouse in there? No! They had a 3D printer that printed food. That's space tech. They're garbage, do you think they threw everything out? Nope, they had a zapper. They were using the zapper. That's how they're surviving. Space gives us paradigm shift thinking that we can solve these challenges. So very quickly, why is this important? What's the purpose? And that's what I was getting to. I'm going to use in the next 40 years, uh, Elon Musk, and this came out, I, I was going to visit Bruce, and I said, I have to listen to this thing that Elon Musk talked about, his speech about the future, because I didn't want to show up not knowing, and it was already like three months or six months in, and I didn't watch it. And all of you probably watched it the day it came out. Elon said he wants to put a million people on Mars in 40 to 100 years. A million people on Mars, 40 to 100 years. Huh. We have 7.5 billion people today. We'll have 9.5 billion in 40 years. And he wants 1 million people. Hmm. 1 million. It's not a lot, is it? He's trying to save the human species. Not, he's not putting whales up there and dolphins and alligators and, and amoebas. He's saving the plan of the human species. So I did a little timeline thinking myself. Now, I add 40 years onto your birthday right now. How old would you be? I'm 56, so I'd be 96. I'd have sons who are 66 and 64. I'd have possibly a grandchild who was in her 30s and, or his, in his 30s, and maybe even a great-great-great-grandchild. In that same time, sea levels will rise 15 cm. China just had its first ever super typhoon. Hong Kong last year had its first ever super typhoon. You might have seen the damage. We never had it. 
and it was 100 miles away from the coast and all that water coming over the edge, if it was closer and on high tide, it would have been 7 to 10 meters higher. It would have wiped out the edges of Hong Kong and all other places. We have the convergence of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic engineering, all coming together, displacing people. So Macedonians right now who earn about 420 euros per month with the average of an 18 to 35 year old is unemployed at 52%. We're not gonna raise their income, but what if we can give free energy for the winter and the summer to keep people warm and cold and drop their cost of living because we have energy coming to us in a different light and the 3D printing capabilities. Mass extinction will continue and that's in 40 years. I believe the human race, I believe we have, and I could be completely wrong, this is my thought, the human race in the next 40 years has to make some choices. What will they be? Because Elon Musk is building an ark and you're helping him and you're not gonna be on it. And neither will your children. And that's 40 years. If it's 60, you probably won't be here for many of you. But people won't move by fear. You're not gonna make changes by fear. But what if we can change that? Project Moon Hut's directive is to get a box of the roof and a door on the moon, as Bruce named it, Project Moon Hut. We're going to have sustainable, uh, sustain, it's not self-sustaining, self it's sustainable. And the innovations that we can create to get that to happen, focus, will drive all the other innovations we ever thought of. Because once we're on the moon, everybody will know it's possible. VCs will open up their wallets. M space mining will happen. Satellites will happen. And Elon Musk is, and Bezos are building their own ecosystems. They're not as much into building everybody's ecosystem. But what if we got together collectively? So three solutions, I'm only going to go over two. One of them is called governance, we talked about it today. The first one is we have to accelerate alliances, and I'll show you how in a moment. We have to educate differently, getting a billion people, about 20% of the population, to think about space. The number is 20. Once 20% of the population believes something or sees something, it changes. And then corporate governance. So let me show you how these all work. Alliance development, right now, if you were to try to find a part for a satellite that you wanted to build, that somebody else has already been manufacturing, but you don't know in Guangzhou, this company does $20 million in sales, 20 million, and every year they get an order for about $100,000 worth of parts. They're not listed as a space company. But anybody who makes a rivet or a software or an application or something is in the space industry. What if we created a platform, but it has to be like Switzerland, and Project Moon Hut is Switzerland, not owned by any government, and has to be connected, that we linked in the LinkedIn capabilities to know all the people in the space industry, and people who are enthusiasts too, and we've got this all mapped out. You could have the networks that come out of Palantir so you could see what's happening. Funding could be available because people can find what industry, some of you are saying, how do I get access to capital? Sourcing like Alibaba, you can't go to LinkedIn and find what they offer but you could see the products they offer. The news like Reddit, media like YouTube, Yelp rating and, and Absorb, which is a learning management system, all wrapped into one to move the space industry. Less than $2 million would do all of this. Finding parts is what Yossi Amin said was his number one challenge. And so was a guy by the name of Dennis Wingo. Dennis Wingo is also a NASA Ames facility. He has uh, Skycorp, is that what it, Skycorp? He has a company, he says, I spend up to half my day looking for parts every single day. But what if using big data and platforms and all the tools, we could find those parts for him? I was talking to someone from the European Space Agency and I once shared, I said, we want to do this. And she said, oh, David, space industry's small. I said, yeah, that's your issue. And then I talked about the part of the rivet that goes in the, in the, in the, in the vessel or device and she said, well, if you look at the space industry that way, David, then it's huge. Duh. Duh. Space industry is enormous, but we don't see it that way because it's being marketed by, as someone said, geeks who keep it very exclusive and elitist. So imagine if you could go into a system and say, I'm looking for a part and see everything that's happening. 
narrow down and find that this company has these people working for it, and I want to hire this person that's connected to this person, imagine the capabilities that you can work with. The industry is also very challenging. I was with Dennis one day, and he, I said, where do you work? And he says, I work in space, David. I said, where? He says, Leo, low Earth orbit. I said, oh, wait, where do you work? And I drew a circle, and I labeled it one. I then went two is atmosphere, three, three, four, three low Earth orbit, four medium Earth orbit, five is high Earth orbit. I went six space, seven around the moon is the atmosphere, eight was the moon, I went up. I said, where does Virgin work? Where does Virgin work? You know. One and two. Big data. I said, where do you work? And he says, I work one through eight. Imagine if the space industry had a way for normal human beings like me to be able to understand where people work. Having data analytics. And there's a lot more to that. And even when it comes to learning, right now, we talked a little bit earlier about a little bit of space. Imagine this. Researchers, educators, individuals, organizers, administrators, event planners, students, all got together and they shared information to help that teacher be able to talk, teach that little bit of space about fashion and space, which they have no idea what's out there. The platform would allow that, but it does something even more powerful. We grow on the shoulders of what we learn from other people, or we learn or see something. So anybody recognize uh, these two conferences here? This is the one we're doing. There's another one coming up in November by a guy by the name of Rick Tumlinson, and I was talking to Rick. I said, you have 500 kids. They all do ex all these projects. What happens when you're done with those projects? What happened to all the Macedonian projects that happened yesterday? Where are they? But imagine if the kids could take photographs of them, put them online as a student, register, then another kid can come and look from Macedonia and see what the other kid has done in the space, and they could build on each other. That's no different from this guy. Anybody know who he is? Why is he famous? Justin Bieber. It's okay. There had to be one of you. Why is he famous? Because a young boy from Atlanta heard about this guy on YouTube, watched his video, flew up to Vancouver, or into Canada, and secured a contract with that person, and Justin Bieber became the phenomenon he is. That is my cousin's child, Scott Braun, Scooter Braun. He found Justin Bieber by building on top. So watch this. You have, let's assume there's 14 people at a conference or an event, and, a little, and, a, and then three of them do projects on space logistics, and two of them do them, uh, three of them doing on uh, using the Project Moon Hunt classification system. We could now have a media person want to find somebody in space logistics. We could have a, uh, a company recruiter or a university be able to find people. You're looking to hire people, you could find out which student is studying what. Look at how fast the industry would accelerate if everybody could find everything immediately. It's like filing everything in your home. You could find it. The space industry is not like this. It is a mess compared to other industries. This will be specifically space oriented. And I know, I know I'm tired of hearing this, that the world is moving towards consciousness. And we're all becoming more connected. And we have the chakra going between us. And the heart and the soul are pounding, and we'll get there. Hope is not a plan, as someone had said, something to that effect. Look around at the people you've seen and the things that have happened in the past five years. The world is not that much more conscious than it was. And by the way, a Buddhist will tell you, when I'm not, someone asks me, a Buddhist will tell you, you fix your life and then you meditate. You don't meditate to fix your life. And people are meditating to take care of the issues that they have with their lives. It's not a plan. And I spoke about the full Project Moon Hunt, not what I did today, in, uh, at Technion University. And I said, could every one of you in the audience who are doing the work at Technion, and I think they said I was the first person ever who didn't have a PhD spoke at Technion, I said to them, could you give us a little bit of time and work on some of the challenges to get us to the moon? And a 65-year-old man walked up to me who was working on black holes and supernovas and things that are happening 400 million light years away or some ridiculous number. 
And he said, my whole life I never realized the work that I'm working on may never be used. I think I need to be spending a little bit more time trying to change how we live on earth. Take a laser beam and you point it at the moon and you move it a centimeter to the left and a centimeter to the right, you'll miss the moon. That's all it takes. We have the ability to create the age of infinite today. It's going to take every one of us to change how we look at the world and how we treat people and how we look at data and how we do. But in Project Moon Hut, I don't care what country you're from, what religion you're from, what belief you have, what structure you have, I don't care where you come from. It doesn't matter. If you want to help, we would love your help. Because this is not a matter of what gender or what you believe in. I don't care, personally, for me. I want our future to be brighter. I want your future and your children's future to be brighter. Because you won't be on that arc. And you have to start doing that now. There's infinite possibilities in the world. There's always a solution. Will we look back in 50 years and say that we didn't make the right choices? Today we can. And you can all be a part of that. There's a podcast called The Age of Infinite that you can look up and listen to. I think Ren, I don't know if you listen to any of them. But there's, uh, there's 19 of them up there, Frank White. There's a fa fantastic one by a guy, Jeffrey Manber. Jeffrey Manber was an American sitting at the Russian table when they started the Russian Space Agency. He told the story that he was on the Russian side. And Rick Tumlinson was on the American side. We heard some amazing things on some of these podcasts. I've only got 19 up, and I'm looking to add to it. There's, there's a website. Uh, it needs to be updated, haven't had the time on that. And so I'm going to give you, you can connect to me on any of these. There's a special gift that I'm going to give you. I'm going to send to Arena the paid to think chapter on innovation. It's going to be as a Kindle version. So you'd have to download Kindle and it's free reader and you can read an, a chapter on innovation. I'm going to give that to you. And for anybody who's interested in reading the paper that we've written for the tech that needs to be built for this. All I ask is, if you read it, you don't build it separately. You see that we need to do it together. And I decided about a year ago I'm giving it away because I want to make sure we build it. It doesn't have anything to do with us. It has to do with all of us. So I'd love to see your help with that. So with that said, hopefully we did a little paradigm shifting today. Thank you.